Hey there, garden nerds. I have a big announcement before we get to today's episode. Over the holidays, we developed and recorded a brand new online course that I'm really excited about. It will help you get ready for spring planting with ease. I created this course to share the step-by-step -step process that I use every day with all of my students and clients for planning your seasonal garden layout on paper before you ever plant a single seed. You can find out more about this exciting new online course at gardennerd.com. Just search planning list to find where you can get on the waiting list and you'll get a free PDF guide that will help you get the most from your small space garden this season. Then you'll be the first to get the details about when the course comes out, when we're ready to launch it. Go search planning list on gardennerd.com. Now on with the show. Welcome everyone to the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where experts from around the world talk shop, share stories, and offer their favorite tip. I'm your host, Christy Wilhelmy. This podcast was recorded in September of 2023, although you're hearing it in February of 2024. Our last interview in our speaker series from the Heirloom Expo in Ventura County, California, features Steve Silverbear McComer. He's a traditional Haudenosaunee elder from the Mohawk community of Kanawake in Quebec, Canada. Steve is a member of the Bear Clan and a faith keeper and manager of spiritual traditional ceremonies at the Mohawk Trail Longhouse. He is also a celebrated artist and two-time recipient of the Canada Council for the Arts Award. Steve shares his knowledge with international audiences about saving seeds and Planting by the Moon, which is what I'm really excited to talk about. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. Well, thank you for having me here today. I'm excited. I watched you give a talk uh, for, it was the Seed Savers Exchange, I think. It was Seed Savers Exchange online uh, annual conference. Okay. Does that sound familiar? Yes, it does. It, no, well. Um, I think that was it. Yeah, I did a number of Zooms because That's of right. um, because of the COVID. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have, you know, I've always... I think my very first gardening book that I pulled off the shelf of a bookstore was Planting by the Moon. Excellent. So I get I got really into that idea from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, how long have you been teaching about that and seed saving? Well, I've been um, oh maybe a good twenty five years, or, or or maybe even more. I I it's something I've always done, and I this was asked to come to. Uh, some small seed gatherings up in my part of the world. And then after a while, I got to be kind of more well-known, but um, all, all as part of the whole, the whole thing is that uh, traveling throughout our territories of Iroquois people or the Haudenosaunee, so our lands are uh, central New York state, southwestern Quebec and southwestern Ontario. And so, uh, and we have 16 communities so we are Mohawks, Oneidas, Anadagas, Cayuga, Senecas, and Tuscarora. And as um, uh, a faith keeper and a person of the longhouse, which is like a traditional um, like a system of life, you know, uh, it, which includes the ceremonial and also kind of political uh, aspects of our people. Mm -hmm. But the a lot of the basis of our ceremonies and our culture is all based around, you know, um, agriculture. So even ceremonies that we do, uh, as an example, thunder dance is in relationship to gardens. So we all follow um, a ceremonial cycle calendar, and within within that, uh, we also have um, planting times, harvesting times, all by the faces of the moon. Okay. And so when I was younger, uh, many of the old people had gardens. You saw gardens everywhere. Then after a while, they start to change as people begin to change and, and different things. And I think uh, maybe that's uh, the truth in all like um, Aboriginal communities and maybe even uh, non-Aboriginal communities where you have a group of people like families, say like the Appalachians where the old people did a lot of this stuff for the younger generations, They're kind not, of moved around yeah. uh, away from it. But I think today, uh, the good thing is that there's uh, a great renewed interest um, and some of it is sparked because of climate change. I think some of it is also sparked from, um, you know, uh, prices of food and, and all that and health issues. So people are more uh, inclined to look towards uh, 
growing things as much as they can possibly themselves. And some people have come up with some very innovative uh, ideas, uh, which is excellent. Uh, I seen uh, where people are doing grow towers. You're right. So you yeah. can use a small space and produce a lot of food. Uh, people are exploring aquaponics. Mm -hmm. People are now getting into microgreens where you could do it basically in, uh, in a, any room in your house or in a basement if you have. And, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, you know innovative potential out there, but the basis is uh, is the knowledge, and um, and it's also finding or having access to good resource of good quality seeds, which right. is important. So for me, uh, Baker Creek, as I'm inviting here, is a very very good uh, resource, and also I would say um, the Seed Savers Exchange is a good resource. Yeah. But there are also some other smaller companies or other companies that do a lo lot of organic things. And, you know, and they're all worth mentioning, you know, but we'd be here all day. Right. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, those are things. But I always encourage people, wherever they are, is to try to um, be involved more locally because it has to do with uh, uh, growing zones. So where I live is a, a zone five, but a, a five A. So I'm in this microclimate okay. where people who even live six, uh, 60 miles south of me have a little bit shorter season than I do. So I am I'm basically in a, like in a river valley of the St. Lawrence between the, um, uh, the, um, the Adirondacks and the Laurentian Mountains. And so, um, so I have a, at least a hundred in uh, 40 to 160 growing days but the frost free days are starting like usually in the middle of may and sometime it would be mid-september but because of i am climate change those things have been changing so you're and it's getting a little bit longer the the season's been getting longer i think last year we didn't get a frost until maybe almost the beginning of december oh wow exactly um but uh and then the spring has been changing where some of the elders have been saying that, well, it looks like Steve, we're like a month behind, which I, I really find to be true. Yeah. Where we be planting in May, now we're beginning to plant in June, just just because of these reasons. Yeah, I've noticed that too in mm -hmm. my Southern California climate, that it's, it's all twisted around and different, mm -hmm. and it's hard to know what is coming. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, even this year, I always encourage people to uh, check with the Almanac and look at the long-term forecasts of your area. So I've been doing this for a number of years, but this year uh, we were supposed to have a dry season and our season began that way. Right. It was so dry that actually in my garden was dust, which I never had. Uh, I'm, I'm saying about six inches of dust Jeez. Uh, as I begin to plant. And the thing that the challenging part of it was when I, I planted my corn, uh, which I planted in the moon phase, by the way. Mm -hmm. And what happened is that all the corn I planted uh, all together on the same day, what happened was that it came up within 10 days. And then about a week later, more came up. And then three weeks later, more came up just because of the way the season was. And then with the uh, unfortunate... Um, um event of the, all the forest fires yeah, you've been that changed that. uh that changed a lot of things so when we begin to get a lot a lot of rain right rain like may, perhaps we never had yeah and uh, the last time it kind of rained that way that i can recall is when uh mount st helens so that the ash in the cloud right you know and it, it rained it rained so uh if you call it climate change or whatever and if people believe in it or not, uh, that, that's up, totally up to you. <laughs> but uh, when you're going to go to the store and complain about prices, then uh, the thing is, we have an ability to do what we can. Even if we live in an apartment, I think uh, one of my elders always told me, he says, you know, Steve, we can even grow tobacco in a flower pot. So the tobacco, when we burn, we use tobacco, we use tobacco in a ceremony, we use it for praying. So we don't smoke our tobacco, we, we cast it upon the fire. Mm -hmm. So in our language, it talks about that. It says we cast the tobacco on the fire. It says, which means we, we, we put the tobacco, meaning on the fire. Uh -huh. So it's not a tobacco or smoking. It's a ceremonial. It, it's, it's a ceremonial tobacco. Yeah. And so it means uh, staying connected spiritually. And it means that anything is possible. You can be in, you know, inventive with that. 
So if you only have a small place and you put a couple, uh, you know, large flower pots, you can grow a really nice uh, tomato. You can grow some fantastic peppers or, or, or a few different things. Yeah. So we can be creative and all of it today, um, especially there was so much talk with GMO uh, that uh, we have, you know, we have, do have options to that. Yeah. Now I want to ask you, because you were mentioning a few different crops. Mm -hmm. uh, do you grow, what are your favorite foods to grow and save seeds from? Well, I grow a lot of, I grow a lot of corn uh -huh. and I grow a lot of beans. And I used to grow a lot of different kinds of potatoes. I still grow a few old varieties. And uh, I like, uh, I like, I love squash like also. So I plant a lot of different types of squash. And I, I hand pollinate them to keep them pure because I don't have very big area. And even when the largest gardens that I've been involved in was like about five acres only, but you can, a lot can be produced in that. And so but today I work with another, uh, another project in my community called the Tree Sisters Garden. Mm -hmm. And it's a project started by a friend of mine, uh, Randy Cross. And he asked me to be involved with him. Uh, he came to one of my, I guess, talks or lectures and uh, he reached out to me and then I've been involved with him ever since. And he's been doing very good and it's a, and it's a project where the, the food is grown and shared with the community so he, he has this model that food is free and so we grow he grows this food under some projects that were obtained through um, uh, a funding uh, program in our community to make these things happen so uh, this is what we do and then we've been involved with uh, some local uh, organic farms in our area and um, and that's how we're creating kind of a network of um, a, a network in yeah. all different type of ways. Okay, two follow up questions to what you just said. With your own squash, and you you said you uh, you can't isolate them because you don't have a, as much distance. Yeah. Are you taping up the flowers after? Yes, that's it. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay, and then what was I've had some varieties that been I've been growing for like over thirty years. Tell me more. Like what? Well, some squash, like Kentucky squash. Kentucky squash? Yeah, it's one of them. I did have um, the, the old-fashioned marble head, but I lost it uh, because in the early years, I didn't really know how to, to hand pollinate, you know. I got advice at that time through the Seed Savers Exchange, which was in the early 1980s, but their formula wasn't really one that worked out very well. Oh. But you learn, you keep on going, and... You know, and uh, I've always just liked squash, so uh, I do a lot of that. Yeah, I love winter squashes. They're so beautiful. Oh, yes. The, this, just to see them and every day how they begin to grow and right to the end of harvest. I think it's like when uh, my uncle always used to say that that's part of the spirituality of it, you know, and the feeling. I did read something one time, I think, in the Organic Gardening magazine, because it's one of the few... Uh, uh, books that I've always read throughout the years. Yeah. That's how I got in contact with with the Seed Savers Exchange in the early 1980s mm -hmm. through there and I met uh, some very very uh, wonderful interesting people uh, Some of them have passed on but I still remember things that I learned and I passed that on to other people So in our ways these things uh, keep on going they 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 have their own life and part of it or part of our natural duty is to teach and share with people. So that's what I do, I share what I can. Yeah. Uh, and uh, knowledge is supposed to be free. It's not supposed to be something that we should pay for or whatever, because uh, us, we say, well, our creator shared this with us, so it's our turn to share back with the people. Yeah. And so uh, being at a, a big ceremony a number of years ago in, um, I think it was in the San Domingo Pueblo, and at the end, uh, uh, and part of the ceremony towards the end, uh, they had uh, ceremonial managers were giving things to the people. And it was very familiar, uh, similar to what we do in our culture. And then I asked, and uh, the, uh, one of the grandmothers said, well, the Great Spirit shared this with us. Now it's our turn to share back with the people. So, uh, you know, this about sharing is always like deeply culturally rooted in our, in our, our peoples everywhere throughout the Americas. Yeah. I know I, I've heard a lot about that and I'm going to ask you a question that yep. kind of comes back to that in a little bit, mm -hmm. but I, I wanted to ask you, um, 
are there, because you mentioned that you're growing, you like to grow corn. I know that corn is very promiscuous in terms of seed saving. So are, are there any traditional seed saving techniques that you use for that process or any of uh, well, not just corn, but any of Yeah, well, with, with corn, uh, you could grow a couple of varieties in a, in a, in a large field uh, pretty much together. Mm -hmm. uh, usually you, you'll know that they don't uh, pollinate at the same time mm -hmm. so you take that into consideration and then the other thing that uh, the way I plant and the way most of our people plant we you plant with the wind direction okay so you don't you don't plant uh, crosswind from one another you plant with the direction the wind is going so where I live kind of wind is always east to west so you can have some on this side and some on this side and you can have it separated by sunflowers whole beans or everything else but most of all they, they pollinate at different times so you almost don't have any cross pollen so and if you do get some they just throw it in the corn soup the corn soup and that's so it are you getting are you planting them like two or three weeks apart so that they don't flower no, the no, no. yeah they, they can be all planted all uh, within the, the the moon phase which okay. is seven days so within that time but you know there's some we have some varieties that are at 120 days all right then we have some varieties that are 90 days got it okay so that's how you do that so you're playing with days to maturity yeah and i do i do the kind of the same with beans uh because for some reason beans seem to cross now where they didn't in that one time oh, really? yeah you're seeing that yeah i've seen that you know so uh so uh, my practice is that i've been growing some what i consider the long season beans first then the shorter season beans secondly and i plant them within two moon phases so moon phases in May and moon phases in June. And so what happens there, they don't really cross. And then the longer varieties, such as uh, a pinto bean, as an example, is a longer season bean. Where you would have a uh, snap bean is a shorter season bean. So you have that and then you let them uh, continue on to dry. So what, what we do is, uh, like in particular, as an example, is pole beans. So Whatever you can't reach, you leave that, and that becomes your seed. Those are your dry beans. And, and, and yeah. most of all, that's usually some of the first uh, that set pods and everything, but you can't reach them. So you just leave and let them mature. And then you, after they're re very well dried, and then uh, you, you can store them in paper bags and tool or sack. Uh, outside in, a, you know, in an oak building, a shed, a garage, and let them get cold too. And then when you need to use them, and then you, you know, put them in, uh, uh, my friend had um, what he called a Cherokee bean bag, which was kind of a, a big sack okay. there, there that uh, put all the beans in, uh, hit it with sticks. Oh, to, on it. to yeah. get the yeah, pods break, off. Yeah, and then, uh, then wind it. Right, winnowing. Wind for your, your, yeah. But, yeah, I mean, usually I do that with, like, a box fan and two buckets. Yeah, You're but it, I, I wait till it gets windy outside. You get windy days. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the, the the guidelines for planting by the moon. Because walk us through the process. What do you well, the moon with? is the moon is uh, made up of four four parts. Okay, so it begins with a new moon, mm -hmm. uh, the half moon coming up, or the wax. I call it the wax on, and then there's the full moon which is the third, and then the fourth is the dark side of the moon. If you're into Pink Floyd, <laughs> you know. There's all that. There's all of that. <laughs> so uh, so what happens that, so also, so in the, in, uh, the lunar calendar, it's made up of 13 moons. So uh, we use a turtle as uh, the symbol of our mother, the earth. Mm -hmm. And then on the turtle, the back of a turtle, there are 13 sh shells. Oh, right. the, so uh, those are 13 moons. And then along the edge of the turtle, there are 28 small little plates all the way around, which are 28 days in a lunar month. Got it. So a turtle is uh, our, our living calendar. Wonderful. And so, so a lunar month is of 28 days divided by four. So each part, it has seven days. So seven times four is 28. Mm -hmm. 28 times 13 is 364 days, a perfect year. Okay. You see, so even in the calendar that people use, there's a leap year. So there's a reason for that. It's not a day that just disappeared or appeared, you see. It's a catch-up day. Yeah, why? 
uh, the Aztecs actually had a day that in their calendar that was called a hollow day. So it's a physical day that came, but they call it a hollow day in their calendar. So what they did is they uh, they actually stayed quiet and very little movement and everything. Okay. So um, so in the regular calendar, there's a leap year. How come one year there's 29 days and another year is uh, the rest of it is 28? There's reason. Anyways, so this goes. This shows a perfect uh, calendar. Uh, so then you're breaking up your tasks of planting during those seven, those four increments. Yes. So the beginning is all, so in the new moon, and we never see the new moon, we see the second day, which is a little sliver. Right. So in our language, it's it's, it's referred to as a claw, actually a claw like of a bird. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then uh, in there is all the things that are green, green, the greens is everything. So greens are uh, cabbage, lettuce, spinach, those are greens, herbs are greens, flowers also are part of this, uh, of this time. Uh -huh. Um everything that's green and and even people now ask me about uh cannabis so they talk about they, they talk about uh medical medical uh, marijuana yeah, yeah and they talk about recreational uh-huh and sometimes they ask me well what kind do you grow so i just tell them like teaching chong industrial <laughs> so this is all in the new moon uh-huh so now in the second phase is the wax on i call it you know so there's a uh, couple parts there's wax on wax off and sometimes there's no sand the floor in, in there. No, say that again. No, no, no sanding the floor. No sanding the floor. No. Wax on, wax off. No That's sanding. from the Karate Kid. Got it. All right. Yep. So in there is everything that has a seed inside of its fruit. So a pumpkin has seed inside of the fruit, a melon, a pepper, an eggplant, a tomato. Those are all seeds inside of its fruit. Corn. It falls in two categories. It has seed inside of its fruit, and at the same time, it's a grain. It so is a grain, grain is also planted in the um, in the phase. you know in the first phase. Wait. New moon. Yeah. Grains yeah. The new moon. Yeah, grains are in the new moon. Okay. And so uh, in the new moon, uh, things will go quick quickly. So if you're trying to grow a beard to be part of ZZ Top, that's the time you would uh, trim <laughs> your beard, or cut your hair if you want to grow long like Rapunzel. Okay. Okay. Got it. So then we're moving on to the third phase. Uh, yeah. So now the third phase is the full moon. Full moon. Okay. So in the full moon, it's a time of transplanting. Everything that you have gets transplanted at this time into the garden. Uh, if you did it yourself or, or got it at a garden center or wherever you got your plants. Uh -huh. Also, any kind of tree that you're going to transplant, berry bushes, everything that you transplant into the ground gets transplanted in the full moon. Okay. Along with this is also harvesting. You harvest in the full moon. Okay. And if you're canning home products, the best time to can is in the full moon because there, I know there are people that would can and sometimes it would spoil. Uh, it's got to do with being in the wrong phase. Okay. So there's all those things. So on the dark side of the moon, there's no planting. There's only soil preparation adding your fertilizers, turning your plot over, and all these things, and hoeing and weeding is the best time in the dark side of the moon. Okay, no planting. Yeah, so that's all it in, in, the, in the short version. That's great. I love it. Are you going to write a book about this? Yes, I will. I got to get to it now. <laughs> I want to see that book. Now, speaking of books, uh, and sort of circling back to the the community and the sharing aspect of yeah. the culture of, of Native Americans uh, and Indigenous people. Uh, I I recently read Braiding Sweetgrass by uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, and she she really identifies this this I call it an illness mm -hmm. from which we humans suffer, and that is this notion that we're separate from nature. Okay. And and I think it ties into the, the community piece, too, because we feel separate from one another as mm -hmm. well. Um, she also reminds us that gratitude plants the seeds of abundance and that there are ways that we're all here to give back. Mm -hmm. that, that's what you were talking about. Do you think that planting by the moon accomplishes both connection with nature and giving back? Well, um, well, first of all, I I think one aspect 
that I'm not saying it's overlooked, but it should be a, a more uh, a more highlighted is that everything for us is it's a spiritual, it's spiritual. So everything that we right. do from planting uh, seeds, there are uh, rituals, ancient rituals that accompany to that. Yeah. And they are in, they are in within traditional languages that still exist and uh and that knowledge so there's a lot of preparation so it's not taking just a seed so seed in itself it, it's a whole holistic it's wholly holistic yeah. so it includes ceremony it, it, it includes observation it, it includes practicing and passing and sharing down that knowledge to the generations so this is how it's maintained is true when we talk about it as a, a circle of life, so there's like no beginning, no end. It's just continuous. And we have a responsibility as elders to, to as part of our, our original instructions and teaching is to uh, pass down this uh, information to the next generations and share it with anyone who has interest in it. Yeah. And you, uh, you mentioned before we started recording that you recently retired from Corrections Canada. Is that one of the ways that you were giving back? Yes, uh, I, I started in the Corrections Canada like uh, a traditional uh, a chaplain. And so part of my culture is that we grow, we grow corn and we grow gardens. So I, I spoke with the warden and uh, he permitted me to create the gardens and I taught uh, the inmates and we had uh, beautiful, astounding gardens that they were totally amazed. And uh, I, I taught the, the, the gentleman how to plant, how to plant uh, also companion planting. And uh, the best example that ever happened, and I always mention this, is that uh, the gentlemen want to grow corn. So they want to grow sweet corn. So I got a very good sweet corn for them. And they like uh, tomatoes. So I said, corn and tomatoes have to be separated. So they did it that way. So the corn was on one end of the garden and tomatoes on the other end of the garden. And so in the fall, we were able to have a, a ceremony honoring the corn. Uh, in, in, the, in the institution, there's a, an area, like a part of a yard, which is they call um, you know, sacred ground. So, so we had a ceremony there. And it, the gentleman said, this is the best corn they ever had. They had good tomatoes and everything else. So the next year... What happened, there was a different garden keeper, and he went ahead on one weekend and he planted corn and tomatoes right, right against see. each other. And that year, the corn did so incredibly poor, and so did the tomatoes. And they were asking me, they said, Silver Bear, what's, what's going on? You remember when I told you last year? And I says, in here, look what happened. And yeah. you witness for yourself. The unfortunate thing is you lost the entire season because the corn was, didn't grow very well and the tomatoes didn't grow very well. Now, I know from what, what I know is that you shouldn't put them together because the same worm attacks them, but what is the reason that you know? Well, they're just something that, uh, they're just non-compatible. Okay. And so it, it did do something, you know, okay. and it had nothing, maybe not necessarily anything to do with the worm, I mean, or caterpillar, but I, that that's part of it. But I'm also becoming aware, uh, you know, that even through the root system, there are things that happen underground. Uh -huh. and, and, and every plant, like every everything that's alive, generates an energy. And sometimes the energies are not compatible. Okay. And I remember talking about this one time in Mexico, and I said, even uh, there's husbands and wives who don't get along. <laughs> And I was always my favorite because there was a gentleman there and, of course, he went through the translation. And all of a sudden, he had a great big uh, smile on his face and he pointed like that to his wife. And I, uh, I just loved that. That's hilarious. Yeah. So, uh, after retiring from Connect, uh, Corrections Canada, you I think you mentioned you were, you've been doing something else? Well, now, I, now I, I've got elected as a... Uh, a chief on the Mohawk Council in my community of Ganawage. Okay. I ran on the grounds of um, agriculture and, you know, and su sustainable, um, you know. Yeah, sustainable. So now, I'm, so now I'm the chief of agriculture, okay. which it didn't exist before. So it's a new portfolio. So it's working in various aspects with 
there's a lot of uh, you know kind of grassroots ideas in the community but to get in in inside the, the council to help uh, with a political direction for some things to like uh for funding and uh and assisting uh you know in the small independent uh as part of, like the Unitas in Wisconsin, they have a, a wonderful, uh, you know, um, it's called uh, John Hequa, which in our language, and their language is very similar to us. It's what supports our life. So that means everything, the, the plants, the animals, you know, from berries to fruit trees, from their community, they do all of this. They do canning, they do dehydrating and so on. So we went to visit with them so that, uh, you know, we are encouraged by them also so that we can um, use some of their ideas and um, and uh, adapt it for our own needs in, in my community. It's wonderful. Thank you. Sounds like people, well, are people really open and responsive to that kind of initiative? Well, yeah, they are. They are, but it just, it, it takes time. And then sometimes people are kind of leery of uh, politics too. Sure. And that's what's, and I think some of that's part of the challenge. But if you can uh, maintain things always in a positive way uh, in every aspect and then uh, more people will, c will come on board. Yeah, I agree. Uh, all right. Well, it is tip time. Okay. Do you have a favorite tip you'd like to share with the Garden Nerd audience? Well, there's probably a lot, you know, I'm not going to say <laughs> I know, this. I feel like I'm leaving so much on the table here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know. I feel like we need to talk a lot longer. Well, uh, you know, learn how to plant by the moon. Uh, and first of all, I know it, it sometime, well, I'll just tell you this way. When we were younger, where I live in my part of Canada, they always planted on the queen's birthday. Why is that? Because technically the queen, the time of the queen's birthday is uh, the last frost in our area. Okay. Okay, all through that area. Uh, so I live close to the city of Montreal. So all through that area, uh, that's technically the last frost. And and when I went to school, uh, I started school in 1961. And every morning we used to have to sing uh, "God Save the Queen." Oh! But uh, oh. after all these years, I finally found out that we we're singing about Freddie Mercury. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's your tip. That's the tip. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Steve, yeah. for sharing that. Yeah, my pleasure. Expert tip, <laughs> and for being on the Gardener Tip of the Week podcast. Thank you. Where can people find you? Well, I'm on Steve's Garden Tips on the Facebook. That's kind of my own page. And I've been, I've been usually I was posting, you know, what you plant in the different phases, you know. And sometimes I, you know, sometimes I put ketchup in there. And sometimes I put salsa in there. And sometimes I post. these things? No, not. Some I do. And sometimes I, 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 I. I put different kind of pickles in there. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people have a better, oh yeah, well you can plant your salsa on this day, <laughs> you know, or your can of tomatoes. I, I used to like to use that the uh, uh, Andy Warhol uh, painting of all the different kind of tomato, uh, can bowls, tomato oh, can cans, tomato cans, and, and you know, and that just like varieties of tomatoes, you know. Sometimes you gotta be a little creative and it's a good way to even like teach children. Mm -hmm. you, you identify with things, you know. Uh, because there are people don't know that, you know, uh, tomatoes and a ketchup. Right. So there you are. Yeah. Although so, wasn't it Ronald Reagan who made ketchup a vegetable? I, 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 I. Yeah. Something like that, you know, <laughs> anyways, it's all good though. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. All right, garden nerds. You'll find a link to Steve's Facebook page this week on gardennerd.com. We'll also share a link to the farmer's almanac calendar for planting by the moon. That's it for this week. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Visit us for tons of free gardening information at GardenNerd.com. Consider supporting us at Patreon. To become a subscriber and get all kinds of behind-the-scenes goodies, you'll find us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter under GardenNerd1, on Facebook as GardenNerd.com, and of course, our GardenNerd YouTube channel. Happy gardening! <laughs>